let's start our um, introduction. Hello, this is Diane Barrett. I'm interviewing today Susan Lada for the BE Collection. It is March 18th, 2022. So tell me about you and your career. Where were you born? I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. My dad wow. was in the service uh -huh. for two years and I was born during one of those two years. Mm -hmm. So and we came back to the States when I was 11 months old. Wow. <laughs> so I, I don't want to ask you about the travel. Well, my mother, of your mother it was that. horrendous I um, because they had to fly from Frankfurt to Greenland and then Green and, and I was throwing up and I was 11 months old and was not a happy camper during that flight. So, yeah. You're the only child? I am the oldest of five, uh, okay. four biological and one uh, kind of adopted. Mm -hmm. So the oldest. Yeah. You like that position? Um, yes, I do. It, it works well for me and I, it has worked well for me in my 64 years of being on this earth. So, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of responsibility. It I is. Our sister is. is the oldest of six, so I watch her. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Big job. But. Yes, it is. It is. So are your uh, siblings, any of them gay or? Um... Um, I so I have a biological sister. She is not. My adopted sister is, and she's married. Um, is to married her to wife. Woman? Pardon? She's married to a woman. Yes. Uh huh. She's married to her wife. Mm -hmm. And then I have two brothers, and neither of them are gay. I have a nephew that's gay, and um, a niece that is gay that's married to her wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have, uh, gosh, I think 14 or 15 nephews and nieces, so two of them are gay. So uh, in the Girth Archives, the Cal State Dominguez Hills, uh, Karen Clemens is the archivist that we work with, and she uh -huh. pulls that information about the genetic link to homosexuality out. So if a researcher were trying to find some information on it, it's there. Okay. I like that. Yes. Look at how she presents that in her archives. She does a little uh, synopsis of the interviews and she brings that up. Okay, so, uh, that's great. I don't think there's so, been enough recorded about it, but it's definitely there. My sister, who's not my biological sister, came out much earlier than I did. And I don't even, I would not even say that. I got very offended when I told people that I was with Pam because really? they're like, well, I didn't know that you were gay. And I would look at them and I'd say, well, I didn't know that you were heterosexual. Why do we have to define who I am? Can't you just uh -huh. be, I mean, I fell in love with a woman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's who I fell in love with. And so, um, and I, that's pretty much been my my stance, belief, my desire is to not necessarily be defined as a gay woman. Yes, am I gay? I, yes. But I would prefer being defined as a human being that fell in love with another woman and to not have a, I don't like labels. And um, to me, sometimes being defined sexually in a label it doesn't really work. For me. Uh, when did you um, connect with Pam? So we connected in 1995, I believe, and got together in 1996 as a couple. Uh -huh. Where did you meet? We met in Big Sur at a retreat place called Esalen. That's a lovely place. I love Esalen. Yes, I did a lot of healing there. Uh, fabulous, fabulous place. Yes. So going back to now to your family history, so you went to Greenland, then where did you go as a family? So um, we came back to the East Coast. My dad went to grad school in um, Chicago. We moved back to New York in Buffalo, outside of Buffalo, a town called Hamburg. By then, all three of my other siblings were born. Mm -hmm. And then when I was turning eight, so that would have been in 1965, we moved across country to um, LA in a town called La Cunada, where my dad, <laughs> you know where that is? And I, that was where I grew up. 
basically mm -hmm. from eight to, I lived out in California for 30 plus years. Oh, so okay. eight to 30, 40-ish um, and lived in, my parents had a home in La Cunada. I lived in Glendale and went to grad school in Pasadena. Um, so yes, so La Cunada. Mm -hmm. And when did you start your own career path? So I graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So I graduated from there in 1979 with a degree in child development with a study of uh, um, specialty in family. And then I went to um, grad school in Pasadena to a seminary called Fuller Seminary from 86 to 89 and got my master's in marriage family therapy and had a, a private practice in Northridge. For a while, I worked at the Motion Picture and Television Hospital for 11 years as a social worker, um, going to grad school during some of that time. Um, uh, worked at a psych hospital that's no longer in the Valley, in the San Fernando Valley anymore. And then um, was there until I got licensed as a licensed marriage and family therapist in 1992 and was there until I moved to Denver after Pam and I met when we lived in Denver for five years. And then in 2002, moved to Chattanooga. So. And are you happy there? Yeah, we've been here 20 <laughs> years and this is Pam's homestead. Uh -huh. um, it, she, came back here to teach um, at a massage school back in 01. We were living in Denver and she called me and said, I need to move here. And it took me nine months to make the decision that I would move to the South with her. Um, okay. A huge change, yes. And all my family at that time was in California. And so um, that was a big, move as well to not be close to my family because I'm very close to my mom and one of my sisters I'm very close with. So um, made the decision to move here and got here and was so depressed because it was so, so incredibly different from absolutely from California, but also Denver was very different from Denver. And then I got a job working as a, um, a therapist for foster care kids in Northwest Georgia. And I ended up um, driving all over two counties and uh, Chattanooga is very close to the Georgia border in two different counties in Northwest Georgia and saw really was introduced to the southern world here the confederate flag and all the different things that people say about the south happened and so um loved that job um was it was just a, a phenomenal opportunity loved working with the kids and then i got my job at hospice of chattanooga mm -hmm. as a um the director of their grief program and I was there for 19 years until they sold the hospice and the hospice that they bought eliminated my position. So. Um, You're working now? So yes, I currently have, um, I'm working full time at a place called the Austin Hatcher Foundation. And um, it's a nonprofit here in Chattanooga, which works with pediatric cancer and um, the families and the kids. And I, have created their grief program and I'm seeing um, kids and families uh, for individual family therapy, whatever the therapy is needs are of these families. So really like that. And then I have a small private practice. So mm -hmm. I'm staying very busy. Mm -hmm. So what drew you to, uh, you really specialize within the counseling. Yes. This is As, with the grief, you mean? Right. Yes. Um, when we were in Denver, one of our friends worked at a hospice and that really intrigued me. And so I, what, the job that I had working with the foster care kids had no benefits. 
And so just on a whim, I thought, well, you know, I'll apply to this position. And they didn't take, they didn't, they didn't choose me when I applied. And about a year later, I got a call from their HR person saying, hey, we'd like to offer you a full-time job. And I was like, I haven't applied. Within a few days after I started, I was just like, I, I just, I felt like I'd come home. I felt, oh, I felt so incredibly comfortable yeah, and was there for 19 years. That's so, really yeah. So, and I learned a lot. I've learned a lot about grief and all the different, com, you know, various uh, components and yeah. how everybody does grief differently. Um, I've taught a lot, um, love to teach and um, I'm very well known here in the city for someone that has an expertise in grief. I have actually what's called a fellow in thanatology. So my degree is LMFT, comma, FT. And what that means is um, that I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise in the area of um, death and dying. And so it's through an organization called the Association of Death Education and Counseling. And um, so I have had that for probably, I think, 12 years, something like that. So I, I, love, I love that aspect. And um, that's been something that's really fed my soul. So anyway, um, we did a panel. We've done different panels. Karen actually did one on conversion therapy. That's she wonderful. Did, she was the first one, it was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did one on hospice. And um, palliative care and pain management altogether. Oh, great! If I told you then I would have had you participate in that. Yeah, that would have been great. Yeah. I know. So when we come against uh, things, women, as you know, have done really interesting jobs. Mm -hmm. So now we've interviewed about seventy women. So we sort of make them flow together. I can see the spiritual um, aspect that's coming. I never knew so many women drummed. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. So uh, if you ever think of anything, it's fun. And we can revisit things we've already done. Uh, we had Marge, who's a physician and pain manager. Uh huh. And uh, then my uh, Lindsay ran a hospice, the AIDS hospice here in uh, California during the AIDS crisis. She's the nurse. Oh, wow. And Jennifer Black um, does hospice for Kaiser in Portland. Oh, OK. Okay. She's a physician also. So it was interesting. Yeah. So yeah. We're just, how would you, um, so what did you do between, was Pam your first relationship or did you have? She was. Other, she, she was my first Pam. relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I was not looking at, um, you know, I, I Yes, I, I wasn't like thinking, oh, I'm going to get in a relation. Although I did ask her um, Be interested. To, to join me in a relationship. Yes. Um, so which it just evolved and uh -huh. that's what felt right. And so that's what I did. But if you were going to talk to somebody who thought maybe they should be a therapist, or said, what would you guide them in their course? What would you suggest for them? If they wanted to explore being a therapist? Right. And working in grief counseling. Grief counseling is a specialty, as you know, all unto itself. Yes. And people are uh, intrigued with it, but it has a big burden with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, and there's a, you know, there's such an enormous amount of grief in our world. And it's not just all related to death. If you look at the grief that is, I mean, just look at what happened with COVID and all the different losses that um, happened. And, and that's a term called ambiguous loss, which is a death where you're not able, but it's not a physical death. It's a, you know, it's a loss, but it's not a, a actual death of somebody. Um, and, and then this whole collective anxiety that happened as a result for a lot of people. But it, what I would say is that if you feel like that is the area, whether it's grief or you want to get into family therapy or you want to just do some individual therapy, 
is to go and and if you're not sure you want to go through schooling and all that do some volunteer work sign up and get trained to do some something at a you know suicide hotline or some other type of crisis line where you are listening and see how well you listen where does this grief fit into ptsd you know the treatment module so to speak for that again i think that it would go with the whole the whole realm of this ambiguous loss look at right. with when you think of someone that has ptsd there are so many different things that are triggering them for whatever their ptsd is from whether it's from war or sexual assault or physical assault or a car, I have a friend that had a car accident and so now she can't even drive on the freeway because it happened on the freeway. So wherever that PTSD is coming from, there is a loss with it because all of a sudden you've lost a part of you. You've lost a part of what you felt comfortable doing prior to whatever that event or events were. Um, and so I think it has a it has a, an enormous amount to do um, with PTSD. There's so much loss in PTSD, and it's not again. It's that ambiguous piece that I don't think we give a lot of credit to. But there are so many similarities with ambiguous grief and actual grief, and um, I just don't think we give that that credit. Or, or we don't give it a name and a, and a validation, so. So what's been the most exciting part of your life to date? The most exciting, I, I really love my job, my work um, in counseling. I love my private practice. I really have enjoyed creating programs. Um, I think there, there's, I don't think there, People need education on grief. People need education on families. Um, and I, I like educating and I like bringing awareness to people to maybe making some changes. Um, but most importantly, it's just validating, educating and kind of normalizing. You know, we're all in this together. Yeah. If you have other questions you'd like to ask me, feel free to do that. Um, what other questions might I have? Feel free to go back on the web page on the collection and look at these. Um, you'd be interested in the hospice. Mm -hmm. And the, the person that was in 9-11, we just should be coming out just a little bit before yours is. It takes us about three weeks to do all the editing. And sort of. And, uh, Are you continuing to look for other women that are um, lesbian yes, to yes. continue to interview? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. They just have to be over the age of 30. I don't trust the world enough to say, oh, and, and of course the younger women and the men all want to be interviewed. <laughs> yeah, but you're not, you're not interviewing any gay men. No, this is lesbian no. only. Okay. Uh, and they have to be out. Uh-huh. It's not the place to come out. And right. 30 and above. Okay. So in closing, if you knew that your life was ending soon, what would you like to be remembered for? I would like to be remembered for being kind and being um, inclusive um, and being loving. Okay. And treating people including myself, with gentleness and kindness. Sometimes we yeah. can ourselves. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and like Pam has already written her obituary. I have yet. I need to do that. Um, but I, I would love to have a celebration before I die. I'd like to see what the celebration would be like. Huh. Um, I mean, if I, if I knew that I had, you know, if I was given a terminal diagnosis and I knew I had six months to live mm -hmm. and I was on hospice, I would do a celebration before I died. So what would it be? Oh, like? yeah. oh, it'd be fun. We would play music and laugh and share stories and 
eat good food and lots of chocolate and <laughs> um, cry and mm -hmm. hug and touch and just that's the part that I really like. Yeah, 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 and be real. So, well, when were you set that up? Pardon? You could set that up. When's your birthday? I could set up. I'll be 65 in July. Maybe I'll do a great, celebration great. for that. That sounds good. Okay, great. Well, well thanks very pleasure much. to meet you, and we appreciate your referrals. And I'll see Pam soon. And at that time, we can set up a couple's thing. Okay, great. Sounds good. All right. So well, thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Yeah. All right. Take care. Keep celebrating mm -hmm. your life. Okay. Thank you. Right. You too. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.